Hey guys, this is Tommy from the Ravens Creek Study, and wanted to continue through my series on Biblical Theology 101. Essentially, we're tracing the eternal covenant through the entirety of the Old Testament. It's been uh, probably a couple weeks since I've posted my last video on this series. Uh, we've made it all the way through the Torah, and now we've come to the book of Joshua with the conquest of Canaan. And the question at hand is, what is the significance when we look at the overview of the Bible? This is kind of a big deal in the story because, I mean, you don't have the history of Israel in the land of Israel if they don't, con if they don't conquer the land. You know, if they're not able to go, go into Canaan and take the land, there's, no, there's really no Old Testament beyond the Torah at that point. So this is a big event, at least in the narrative, but... If we're looking at an overview of the Bible, is there a significance in the conquest of Canaan beyond just what uh, what it represents for the people of Israel within that land? Um, and that's where that's where kind of this this first slide fits in perfectly. Is that in the Old Testament the physical promises, uh, which we do often consider obsolete, and I think we we consider that too swiftly, too quickly. Um, the physical promises represent spiritual realities. The, uh, and, and by the way, these physical promises, they're not always just promises. Sometimes they're commanded, you know, to build the tabernacle. I have here the temple itself was a reflection of the heavenly temple. I'll, I'll say the tabernacle because the temple came after the tabernacle was a reflection of the heavenly temple. God sits on his throne. You read this in Revelation chapter 4, right? The throne room of God that you see in Revelation 4 there are a lot of images there that you can find reflected in the earthly tabernacle. The king of Israel, you know, Saul and then David, and then the lineage of David was supposed to be a representation of the true king, which is God. Uh, Jesus coming after the Old Testament, but uh, the Old Testament specifically seeing God as king. Uh, the New Testament declaring Jesus as king. Um, the priesthood, Aaron's priesthood, was a representation of the Melchizedek priesthood. This is this is even in the Psalms. It's not it's not a New Testament concept. How is it that Samuel's offering sacrifices when he's not of the tribe of Levi? Uh, he's not of the tribe of Levi, and he's not a son of Aaron. How is it that Aaron? Or, uh, how is it that that Samuel is offering sacrifices? It's through the order of Melchizedek. He is a priest, but not of the order of Aaron. So, uh, the conquest then, if all of these things kind of have their spiritual counterparts, and the spiritual is actually the reality in and of itself, but the, the physical earthly thing is, is more of the reflection, then what is the significance of the conquest of Canaan? Because if we can understand that, it'll help us to understand a bit more as to when we come to the New Testament, uh, what the New Testament is, is grasping at. Because of these reflections and patterns, the conquest of Canaan has rich significance immediately relatable to the New Covenant and Christian life. The tribes who conquered to inherit were the overcomers, and this is deeply significant in relation to 1 Corinthians 10.17 as well as Revelation. Essentially, when you get to the book of Revelation, you cannot, over, you cannot uh, pass this by. You're going to recognize within the second and third chapters, as well as through the rest of the book, there seems to be something here about overcoming uh, every single church to they who overcome. Well, what in the world's going on with this overcoming? Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, 17, uh, there's no temptation that is too large and too great for you, but that in Christ, you can overcome all temptation. And I'm paraphrasing. I'm, I'm trying to use the word overcome in, the, in this situation. So I'm paraphrasing here, but this is what the conquest of Canaan represents. The tribes that conquered their land, their territory that they were to inherit, they're the overcomers. And by the way, notice, uh, notice that the tribe of Dan did not overcome. They did not conquer. They did not inherit their land. They instead found another place that they were able to conquer. 
which might be why the book of Revelation doesn't mention Dan in Revelation 7. It's one possible reason. There, there are a few that I would give, but that's one. Um, the overcoming of the tribes of Israel in the time of Joshua can be paralleled to the overcoming of the saints in our day and age. What it means to be a saint is one who overcomes. That's the very definition. See, Israel, uh, Jacob, when he wrestled the angel, he was renamed Israel, and the angel tells him, the reason I'm naming you Israel is because you've wrestled with God and with man, and you've prevailed. Another way to put it, you've wrestled with God and man, and you have overcome. So you have this rich significance that what it means to be Israel is to be one who overcomes. So for the, the people to inherit the land, they have to overcome these Canaanites. This is, do you, do you see kind of where I'm going with this? There's, there's a physical guerrilla theater at play to, to show forth the spiritual reality. The conquest of Canaan can be seen through the lens of each of the seven nations having some sort of spiritual understanding. Now, I've heard I've heard messages of this where they would go, "Oh, well, you know, the Jebusites represent this, and the the Perizzites represent this, and the Girgashites represent this." I I personally don't spend too much time debating these sorts of symbols. Um, I think that there's enough significance simply in the fact that they needed to overcome. And whatever it is that you and I have in our lives that we need to overcome, you know, think of the seven churches. There's seven nations. And they are bigger and stronger than you, is what Israel is told in Deuteronomy. Seven nations, seven churches. All seven churches were told, if you overcome, then this. Now, two of them, it wasn't said, you have these things that I have against you. And yet still, the word went forth, if you overcome than this. So you have you have seven nations, you have seven churches, all of them being overcome. So because the Old Testament has physical counterparts to the spiritual places, I must concede that the land of Canaan itself represents of sorts eternal life. Think of it this way. Have you ever heard somebody say, oh well I'm about to cross that Jordan and they're referring to their death. They're about to they're about to die and make it into eternity and they're saying, I'm about to cross the Jordan. It's kind of like that. Um to but but I would I would I would say it's not about passing from death into life uh in the sense of physically dying. It's about passing from death unto life in a spiritual sense. I mean, Ephesians 2, this is the heart of Salvation 101, Ephesians 2, you were once dead in your sins and your trespasses, but God has raised you up from the dead, you know, parallel it with Romans 6, uh, if you've, di you've died with Christ, so that the same glory of the Father that raised Christ has raised you from the dead, therefore you are now no longer a slave to sin, now you are dead to sin, but alive to God in and through Christ. So I, I think that the crossing of the Jordan, the, the overcoming, the, the conquest of Canaan, that this represents an eternal life, that there is a, a crossing of the Jordan, that you come into the land, but then there's still an overcoming. You have to, that's the work of sanctification. You have to come into a place of overcoming those old habits, those old mindsets, those old addictions, and all of the like. To triumph over the dwellers of the land, who are recognized as having their sin reach, reach fullness, is likened to triumphing over the principalities and powers. I mean, we can go into the whole sinful nature thing, but ultimately, it, it isn't just about overcoming sin, it's about overcoming the demonic principalities and powers that are over our lives, over our, our cities and our, our states and our nations. It's about overcoming those principalities and powers and the wisdom that they teach us and they, that they teach society. We have come into the kingdom of God. We're no longer in the kingdom of darkness. Now, the very fact that it's called a kingdom should tell us it has its own culture, its own understanding, its own way of viewing things, its own lifestyle, uh, it, its own kind of uh, cultural cues and the ways that it, it views things. We need to be able to continue to progress out of this, out of this darkened kingdom 
that has its value system, its wisdom, its mindset, and to continue to re renew our mind and to understand better as to what the kingdom of God is promoting, the value system of the kingdom of God, the wisdom of the kingdom of God, the mindset of the kingdom of God, the lifestyle of the kingdom of God. This is what it means to triumph. This is what it means to overcome, is to continue to come into deeper and deeper understandings to the point in which you have overcome the principalities and powers. You are no longer under their, uh, I guess, their, their hex. Uh, the overcoming and inheritance of the days of Joshua is rich in significance for the very fact that it can be paralleled with Revelation 12. That somehow the overcoming of these saints in verse 11 is wrapped together with the casting down of the dragon upon the earth, a triumph over the powers of darkness. Now, that specific chapter has a very end times focus. But just because it has a very end times focus does not mean that there is not a spiritual significance to it that reflects our daily life here and now. Just because Revelation 12 is an event that, that is to take place one day in the future doesn't mean that we can't experience it at least to a degree, at least to a... a um, there, there is a significance to it here and now, is what I mean to say. So, this is the idea of the conquest of Canaan. This is kind of the, the nub of what the conquest of Canaan represents to us. Um, so, I guess <laughs> that, that's all I have for this, actually. Um, hopefully that maybe brings out the idea of what the conquest of Canaan is, gives you a better understanding of the book of Joshua, gives you something that when you read the book of Joshua you can look for, and you can try to understand it in the whole of the scripture as to what the book of Joshua is signifying. Um, so until next time, uh, we're going to be talking about Samuel next, and until next time, I bid you grace and peace in Christ.